Bună ziua tuturor! Astăzi ne întâlnim în cadrul unui eveniment științific-practic, unde ne vom, pur vom purta discuții și dezbate împreună cu experți din domeniul securității, reprezentanți ai mediului științifico-academic și ai societății civile, în cadrul mesei rotunde combaterea știrilor false în condițiile provocărilor de securitate COVID-19. Este inițiativa Institutului Național de Informație și Securitate de a lansa o platformă de comunicare, discuții și dezbateri dintre societatea civilă, mediul științific și serviciul de informație și securitate pe subiecte de securitate și interes național. Constituirea unei platforme de comunicare pe probleme de securitate în limitele competenței și ținând cont de sigur de specificul activității sale în scopul transparenței și creșterii culturii de securitate în societate, constituie una din prioritățile pentru Serviciul de Informație și Securitate a Republicii Moldova, în contextul prerogativelor sale de modernizare. Mie îmi spune Diana Hârgu Benchit și astăzi voi modera acest forum de dezbatere online, care constituie o prima activitate în form formatul propus, ori combaterea știrilor false și a mijloacelor de promovare a lor este o prerogativă atât pentru instituțiile guvernamentale cu atribuții în domeniu, în special al Serviciului de Informație și Securitate, care are atribuția de a asigura securitatea informațională în stat, cât și din partea societății civile și a mediului științific, care prin proiectele sale de cercetare și practice în domeniu promovează studii și politici antiștiri false. Vreau să mulțumesc, să mulțumim partenerilor evenimentului de astăzi, Institutului de Cercetări Juridice, Politice și Sociologice, Facultății Relații Internaționale Științe Politice și Administrative din cadrul Universității de Stat din Moldova, Facultății de Jurnalism și Științe ale Comunicării, cât și Asociației Promolex, pentru parteneriat și colaborare. Totodată mulțumim Asociației Presei Independente că sunt alături de noi ca să-și împărtășească din bogata sa experiență în combaterea știrilor false. Uh, I welcome our foreign experts and thank you for accepting to share us the experience of your countries and in combating false news in general and especially in pandemic situation COVID-19. Dear participants, first of all, thank you for your patience in order to understand that uh, Romanian is not your native English, not nat native language. Uh, thank you for joining us, and um, I would like to approach uh, the subject of experience uh, of Georgia, Armenia, Romania, France, Netherlands, and Poland in uh, combating uh, false news, uh, especially COVID-19, because um, uh, to sharing experience of your countries, uh, it will be an example for our countries too, in uh, politics and uh, practice uh, activities in order to combat, to combat false news. Uh, in uh, this world, I, 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 I welcome all uh, uh, our participants from uh, this mentioned, this mentioned countries. Um, I'd like uh, to ask Professor Vaktang Maisaya. Uh, Georgia became a kind of successful story uh, for fighting against uh, the COVID-19, yes. And uh, despite the fact that uh, declaring emergency situation, Uh, even due to case that no one of militaries uh, or, for example, who are taking in force uh, the strict measures in the red zone have been diseased uh, with COVID-19. So this is, uh, this is a, a success for Georgia. And uh, tell us, Professor Maisaya, uh, please, uh, which are the measures of your country, uh, of your country's health authorities and uh, how Georgia Uh, fight against false news in these critical times. Okay, permitted me to salute per toti. So what uh, what Thank this? What, what I have just only Romanian language. Sorry for my pure poor Romanian language. I'm more just keen in uh, English, Spanish, Russian, uh, Polish, and etc. Ukrainian language, but unfortunately, very few in Romanian language. Mi pardone. 
so uh, just I would like to uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Professor Oktam Isaya. I'm professor of Caucasus International University. I'm also a professor of the several Polish universities uh, and also San Diego universities in the United States. Uh, just my field of specialization is political science and national security studies, as well as combating terrorism and etc. And uh, in that regards, I would like to express enormous thanks uh, uh, to Professor uh, Diana Benczewski, who just organized this very well, well organized and most important event, most in a such a drastic, challenging uh, period of time when we are perceiving a new asymmetric, I would say, warfare. It's like a not actor, but center directed, uh, how it call uh, center directed asymmetric challenge about the biological, about uh, informal war, uh, which is uh, imposed by the COVID-19 effect. So of course, uh, I would like to mention, first of all, that Georgia, just I was starting, uh, I will take to be as short as possible and not just to not to consume much time of your attentions uh, and the deliberate uh, attention. And uh, let's mention Georgia joined this uh, COVID or engage in a COVID uh, so-called informal warfare or just combating the COVID effects in uh, March 22. I guess, you know, just uh, mainly effect of the March uh, in the COVID-19 effect, geopolitics started in the beginning of the March. Of course, Georgia, as many just about other actors of international relations, have been no aware of this uh, so asymmetric challenge, which then, of course, uh, 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 just increased from the local to the global level dimensions. And of course, uh, we also just lost some time, mostly about uh, a fortnight or two weeks we lost about to get fully aware what uh, did uh, what does this uh, challenge mean for us and even just for regional and global security perspective. And Georgia joined this combatic uh, visions uh, on March 22, when Georgia government declared a complete quarantine, uh, quarantine uh, just uh, conditions uh, and also just uh, shared to the all uh, territory of Georgia. Georgia also declared a state of emergency and also just a curfew was imposed because in Georgia still till uh, May 22. So tomorrow, uh, the May 22, the curfew, curfew just been, will cancel, and Georgia is steadily began to just uh, back uh, to the normal life of, uh, uh, normal social life. But some, some measures of the quarantine still will be imposed, which was uh, declared by the prime ministers as of yesterday. He just uh, given his uh, uh, just brief, uh, information and brief to the Georgian mass media means representatives. And uh, Georgia just also the first uh, as a um, uh, actor, as a actor of the international relations and uh, uh, state, just uh, uh, imposed uh, the curfew and uh, let the militaries to came to the uh, power and to also just when Georgia created so whole four red zones, uh, which Mar Mar Neoli, uh, Bolnisi, uh, Rustavi and Tbilisi uh, clusters, because where the main infected people been just located and just been uh, segmented. So and I would mention that at time of being, we have about more 700 infected persons, which composed about 0.02% of the whole population of the Georgia, which is relatively a low, just about profile of just about disease uh, uh, threat uh, to Georgian national security and such and you absolutely fully agree with uh, uh, diana that uh, professor diana that uh, just georgia became becoming the uh, successful story in combating uh, covid 19 effect because you know georgian government and, so and society they just began initially to some however very radical form to cast and to deal with this problem with initial stages of course we just lost about two weeks but the two weeks will just compensate it with directly uh, just fully uh, aware of the seriousness of this uh, problem, of this challenge. And uh, Georgian government began to impose its law about on emergency uh, situations, which was enacted as a know, 2002 year. And uh, of course, uh, the parliament also just, uh, Georgia also just, you know, according to the new constitutional 
uh, principles. We are, uh, Georgia is like uh, declared as the parliamentary uh, or just oriented uh, uh, country. We just parliamentary run country. And we, we transfer to, transferring from the presidential to the parliamentary style. And the Georgian parliament fully just support and fully just uh, deliberate its power to the executive uh, branch of the power, to the government, the full, uh, full just, I would like to say, uh, full uh, power just about uh, uh, capabilities. And, uh, and Georgian government became such quite, uh, quite effective, and effective and efficient uh, structures in order just to, well, taking, uh, taking over and try to overcome this uh, challenge uh, problem. Uh, but I will just be more uh, precise. I will show you just uh, some uh, points uh, and four points why Georgia became a successful story. And I will just uh, give my uh, survey a bit a bit later and uh, try to more analyze why Georgia was a successful story. But before, because our topic is about uh, all the panels of this the topic is like experience in combating false yes, news and yes, yes. the COVID-19 pandemics and disinformation and mice is COVID-19, how we recognize and approach them. I would like to mention that uh, we just, uh, I also just prepared some uh, just about talking points uh, for reflecting of this uh, false news, uh, well, information strategy, which also been shared by the Georgias as well as the many other just countries. And you know, just a new uh, Cold War, which was embraced uh, between the United States and China, and the main just new Cold War was originating mainly and started with a information psychological warfare when China and the United States they blamed who just been stood behind all this uh, origin of the COVID, whether it was artificially or original one. And of course, uh, when uh, dealing with Georgia, I will just more, uh, 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 this I would like to pinpoint it about three uh, uh, options of uh, fake news provisions in Georgia, which we nowadays face in the time of being. First is about conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory, which also very become very popular in Georgia, saying that this uh, COVID-19 was like a special, just about inspirations of the global government, and it was like inspirations of the just about unknown, just about hand unknown forces who would like to just about uh, take all powers to the world order and uh, the global one common government still dominated even over us. This was became very popular. Even some uh, Georgian priests and Georgian just about religious uh, persons even articulated with just uh, in their during their, their prophecies and their just about the ceremony cases that uh, Georgia is like a, became the part of this uh, uh, united or just common uh, global government uh, just effect and even just uh, they been approached to not to adopt its so-called 5G technologies that is like a biggest is it, that it could cause the biggest threat to Georgian populations etc cetera, etc cetera. so this conspiracy theory also becomes the first just about fake news provisions or options which became most uh, popular among the populations and of course uh, and of course just trying to perceive about a uh, maybe false inspirations uh, how uh, the Georgia could combat really with this unknown challenge, asymmetric challenge, which we named COVID-19. And even Georgian government even just had to uh, just pre prepare some special just about strategic, uh, some um, strategic just about um, um, compilations in order just to combat with that, with that conspiracy theory. It was even just, it was about some clashes between the Georgian government and uh, uh, Georgian patriarchy. It was not a clash, but some like uh, just about uh, uh, debates about whether we have to just to run this, um, you know, because it coincided uh, uh, with this uh, 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 research issues about holidays, uh, um, uh, holidays, religious uh, holidays. And uh, even just Georgian uh, government even uh, had to even just try to more resisted some just uh, Georgian patriarchs uh, representatives, just like okay. statements, okay. but they also made some consensus, but due to the joint effort, they made, but even just more aggressive towards the Georgian uh, patriarchy became the so-called United Oppositions, who also been, became more radical, and between them, these oppositions and even Georgian patriarchy, even they just uh, been launched as informal war, somehow informal information war, 
which was became some quite clear case. So uh, second, uh, second, just about uh, options was about Russian's information psychological warfare. It's for sure, because uh, the COVID-19 effects, the Kremlin began to uh, just more implicate and try to more uh, not to use the time, and they also just became to increase the just about hybrid warfare strategy over the Georgia. You know, by that time, Russia began to more. Uh, just uh, e expand its so-called uh, uh, creeping occupations because and still began to more uh, began to more seize Georgian internal territories, which was uh, uh, be became a near territories of the Tsinwali and Khazin occupied territories. First of all, second, Russians' information mass media means they began to launch a special campaign against the Luger uh, Luger uh, uh, Luger um, uh, laboratory which was uh, also just mentioned that this laboratory just also artificially just, you know, manufactured this some biological agent, agents and they been disseminated and it was the main cause of dissemination of the COVID-19 just about the disease, which absolutely uh, uh, not only fake, it was a mastermindly proposed uh, information psychological warfare. It was like a new type was delivered among the Georgian uh, society and this uh, mysis was um, disseminated by the local pro-Russians, some agents, I would say, some NGOs, some mass medias, and uh, some just about uh, political parties, which also just supported and uh, financed from the um, Russia. Uh, professor, and thank third, you. Yes. Yes. And third, yes. and third one, in Spanish servant, I also mentioned information civil war. This information mm -hmm. civil war, it means that the Georgian just about, you know, some, uh, it was like a civil war was between the Runic party, Georgian dream with United Oppositions. And this information civil war also increased with a high level of this intense. And I would like to mention especially to respond to these uh, challenges, by the way, in information fake strategy. Yesterday, European Parliament adopted a special resolution on Georgia where uh, the European, uh, European uh, Parliament just pointed out on stopping local information civil war and cast with Russia's propaganda warfare. So this was even just held such international reflections. Thank uh, you. I see, Pro Professor. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask you about uh, Georgian legislation on uh, combating false news, but uh, we'll keep this question uh, a little bit la later okay. because uh, okay. I want to give a floor for uh, to Dr. David Pipoyan because he has a lesson in a couple of minutes. Uh, please, uh, uh, David. Uh, what is the role of Armenia's, Armenians' social media uh, in the dissemination of fake news on COVID-19? What is the situation in Armenia now? Thanks a lot. Um, and I would like to highlight that in Armenia we had emergency situation. And during emergency situation, majority of the information was from national authorities. And unfortunately, only social media had significant control for fake news. But uh, one peculiarity of the country is that Armenian society is really very active. And uh, the Facebook, Twitter, and other sources of social media, they also have really very significant contribution for spreading of um, misinformation and of course false news. So two aspects which I would like to highlight due to the fact that I'm introducing the scientific center and my major is risk assessment. Uh, the process of risk analysis has really very important component which is risk communication and risk perception. And unfortunately, um, some Facebook posts uh, related to COVID as a new disease and false allegations uh, regarding the cattle or canon coronavirus spread through uh, Twitter or Facebook and misleading statements on the safety of protein consumption confused producers and consumers. And um, unfortunately, uh, our first fake news was related to banana keys, that banana can be the source for COVID-19. Uh, and I would like to introduce our experience related to uh, scientific center, the role of scientific center. Uh, so science has really very important role uh, for controlling uh, this kind of information. And um, thanks uh, to five years experience uh, that we are working with Armenian society, and we are familiar uh, with the reactions of uh, Armenian society. 
uh, we started to um, um, promote that food uh, and also banana cannot be the source for COVID infection, but you cannot imagine the impact for this uh, fake news. So um, our center is responsible for investigation of uh, food consumption. Um, during one week, uh, banana consumption was decreased 190%. Uh, which means that the role uh, and the perception of risk for society was really very significant. So, um, uh, against uh, the wave of speculations and fake news, scientific facts matter. Yeah, the strains of coronavirus affecting animals differ from a new virus uh, strain currently affecting humans. And um, it was also another opinion that um, sick animals also can be the source for spreading this disease. So while there is a lot of ongoing research is, um, in order to determine where the livestock might be experience uh, any kind of minor infection or even carry the virus uh, mutation responsible for COVID-19, uh, to date there is no such evidence. So uh, for Scientific Center also it was very difficult to react in, uh, during March, I mean uh, the first days uh, of infection due to the fact that also scientific literature and also scientific sources were, given, um, they were giving a lot of information which were contradicting uh, to each other. So um, Armenia is not such kind of rich country in order to react. Um, and for us, uh, it was really, um, it was a challenge. And a lot of conceptual confusion um, arose due to the nature of coronavirus. Um, you know, the second issue was that coronavirus and COVID-19, uh, they are different diseases. And there is also one um, medicine, Russian, um, by, produced by Russian producer. Um, and the second effect was that um, the medicine, which is very effective for coronavirus, um, can treat, um, you know, this, uh, this disease and the issue that in Russia is not spread this disease due to the fact that they have, you know, that this information was spread not only in Armenian social media but also Italians were insisting that the phenomenon of uh, Russia is the fact that um, this, um, this issue uh, and, um, you know, I was trying really to investigate the literature, also scientific literature, in order to understand if um, it can be really effective uh, for COVID-19. Um, and I was really very happy that uh, some Chinese researchers, they investigated the effectiveness of um, uh, effectiveness and they, they were declaring that, of course, it is not COVID-19 specific, but uh, it can help and they used also in China uh, for the treatment of, of this disease. Um, and uh, as I've already um, highlighted, um, that conceptual confusion was related to um, the nature of uh, Corona Ninde, which is largely the family of uh, viruses, um, which form genera. Um, and um, we could uh, spread this information um, and another, the, the third issue, I mean, in, in Armenia we had these uh, several steps um, and it was really very interesting also the reaction and the perception. Uh, when we had only really uh, four or ten cases of coronavirus, the panic for coronavirus was more than now that each day we have more than 100 uh, cases of coronavirus and you know, as a society, I, I um, have to highlight that now there is no really that panic of coronavirus uh, in Armenia. And now we are trying really to uh, disseminate information in order to struggle this theory of uh, conspiracy, you know, that this, this virus was created in laboratory in order to have vaccination. And even there is um, um, not only in Armenia, but this widespread opinion regarding the chips uh, of the, um, um, and, you know, this, this theory of Bill Gates and a broad variety of virus, uh, as I've already mentioned, these, these claims uh, make no sense. It must be noted that the 
actual name uh, of the virus that caused COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, whereas the coronavirus for which uh, cartel vaccines is available is called the BCB, and one of the affecting dogs um, um, which wouldn't work across the species other, um, due to the fact that in Armenia, unfortunately, we have uh, you know, the, the, the dogs, the issue of the dogs and, uh, uh, in, in mass media and in the social media particularly, it was information that the dogs um, um, can spread uh, this virus, the animals can spread this virus. And our main reaction was uh, to refer only um, scientific sources and to give that information to the society to follow only scientific sources. But here I have to be sincere that um, even scientific sources are giving information uh, which is misleading. Um, not, not misleading, but um, you know, uh, which is not precise. I mean, the precision of the information, unfortunately, is restricting the scientists. And you know that um, it was very interesting article regarding um, UV lights. Uh, that it is really very effective um, and it was highlighted that the countries where the UV index is more than 10, um, you know, this is really very effective and in Armenia the UV index is really very high, uh, particularly in June, in July, uh, it is more than 10 UV index uh, and as a scientific source, um, we were thinking that it's an affordable source. But unfortunately, now uh, we are doing real research, uh, particularly in Brazil, uh, where the UV index is more than 10, but you, you see the, the real situation in Brazil also, that we have the spread of the information. Um, and the peculiarities of COVID, uh, it was a challenge not only for society, but also for scientific center. And another issue which I would like to highlight, I, I, I'm more than sure that all the countries uh, faced this, this challenge that World Health Organization also is changing the opinion. For society, it is really very difficult uh, to understand um, why the situation um, is changing drastically. And uh, I, I have to be sincere that our ministry, which was following um, the rules, the guidelines of World Health Organization. Uh, you remember very well that when uh, the issue was only in Iran and only in Italy, uh, Armenian society was really thinking about the roads. I mean, we have uh, direct connection with Bergamo, we have direct connection with Rome. You know that Armenia has also the border with Iran, which is really very active. And the Armenian society was um, really thinking about the uh, closing and uh, for me measures for restrictions. And, you know, our Minister of Health was following the rules of World Health Organization that. Uh, COVID-19 is not very dangerous disease, so we do not need special restrictions for this disease due to the fact that um, WHO um, was giving that message to the society and even the, um, the effectiveness of quarantine, the effectiveness of masks, etc. And after uh, changes, uh, policy changes also in WHO, you know, the risk communication is very peculiar issue. I mean, uh, perception of the risk for society, it's really very difficult when you change your opinion uh, in February and in March, where when society was really thinking about these restrictions, uh, nobody was giving information of social responsibility to the society, and only after uh, first cases in Armenia, the risk communication policy was changed and uh, the message which was given to the society was the social responsibility and the role of the society for struggling um, with uh, coronavirus. And uh, the second issue which uh, I would like to highlight uh, how to avoid from uh, misinformation and it is also a global issue. I mean, it is not only the issue of Armenia, and some data related to Italy, I would, I would like to give some data, particularly as COVID-19 cases have surged across the globe, so has misinformation, you know. According to the research by the uh, Bruno Kessler Foundation in Italy, 
I would like to give this information also. Um, every day in Italy, um, during the March, an average of uh, 46,000 new posts on Twitter linked to inaccurate or misleading information about the crisis. I mean, even the countries with appropriate um, risk communication policy uh, had the issue um, regarding uh, misinformation. And, you know, another issue which I would like to highlight the rapidly changing situation means that people are naturally grasping for information about the pandemic. So um, what's the, the best way um, to, to separate the trustworthy uh, from the fake? And um, you know, some experts also were asked uh, for scientific communication and misinformation, what readers should keep uh, in mind while uh, watching the news, reading an article, or of course, uh, scanning Facebook. And uh, there are some uh, important uh, sources, and we have to understand why COVID-19 uh, and misinformation yeah, started, uh, started to spread. And um, not only um, you know, in, in, in Armenian society, but everywhere. And if um, you have found yourself unsure uh, whether a sound, like a um, sound beat or a headline you saw the shared was true, know that you are not alone yet. And um, uh, even um, you know, uh, the experts, the sophisticated experts who study science and political communication. So uncertainty and anxiety about the pandemic combined with the uh, political overstones. So uh, this is really very important. And the research on political misinformation suggests emotions like anxiety and under impact how people process like news, which itself often goes uh, viral due to ability to provoke emotions. And, um, you know, Unfortunately, during recent days uh, in Armenia, we have more than um, um, like the, during the last two days, we had almost 500 new cases. Like Armenia is a small country, only 3 million uh, inhabitants, yet the population, and our data are close to German, like um, the German cases. And now uh, there is, uh, the social media, and not only the social media, but also official sources, are spreading information regarding uh, new posts um, in a very, very big uh, post for 206 persons in order to give social responsibility to the society. Uh, but this, this type of information must be um, investigated due to the fact that we have to understand also the impact of pandemic, you know, that this is a recent definition um, and as a specialist of this field, I have to be really sincere with you. Um, um, you know, uh, this is really very important to keep the balance. I mean, of course, social responsibility is really very important for the society and for the effectiveness. But, you know, we have to stabilize also this type of communication due to the fact that society must understand that we are going to um, live with coronavirus. I mean, um, you know, that in countries like Armenia, uh, the business also, you know, had uh, difficulties uh, due to the fact that we had almost two months of um, emergency situation. Uh, and I would like to highlight that uh, I, I was always comparing also the policy. I mean, um, as, as the specialist of this field, particular, particularly in the field of risk communication, um, I was used to work also in Italy, and my experience was uh, related to Advanced Institute of Health, um, Instituto Superiore di Sanità. And you know, Italian policy for risk communication is totally different. They had a special um, responsible body for risk communication. They are spreading only official information. But you know that uh, last year we were discussing also this issue when you refer only official information and when there is a restriction of information. So mass media, uh, of course, will give only that information. But now we have to understand that the social media has significant role. And you know, the population, uh, for, for them, the source of information is not TV and not the radio, 
but the Facebook, um, and, you know, Twitter, etc., which means that you must build the trust and your scientists and uh, uh, experts who are responsible for risk communication are um, very, in Armenia at least, they are very active also in different groups of Facebook and uh, like during these two months, they are always tagging me, they are always tagging my colleagues in order to give scientific explanation. And this is a very effective, really very effective way. And we have to understand um, that we must face the challenge that the social media now has really very important role. And um, as I've already mentioned, Armenian experience um, is uh, during two, three years, involvement at scientific organizations and the experts who are also very active uh, in this field in order to give precise information to the society. But the, um, the COVID-19 was really, um, it was a challenge for everybody. I mean, for us also. And now uh, we are investigating also the COVID-19 impact on nutrition uh, and also dietary patterns of the society. Um, and after the uh, finalizing uh, this paper, uh, we would like uh, to share also this information with, with society uh, and to give um, get the impact uh, for the society. And I would like to conclude uh, my um, speech with the fact that, uh, you know, unfortunately, the misleading information, and in case of coronavirus, it was not only uh, the problem of misinformation or fake news, but it was also the issue of um, uncertainties uh, and the communication of uncertainties. As a scientist, I want to be sincere uh, with you. Um, as a scientist also, they don't want to take this responsibility in order to give uncertain information to the society, as it can have also very negative impact for the reputation of, of these experts. That's why, um, you know, um, now the modern societies and of course uh, policy makers, they must understand that uh, we must be ready also for such kind of information and we must be really very careful with the spreading of information, particularly as I've already mentioned, uh, during the March or, or the, at the end of the February, our ministry was insisting that coronavirus is not such kind of dangerous disease. Uh, of course, um, the population is cutting from the context due to the fact that the minister uh, was insisting the list of uh, dangerous diseases. Of course, COVID is not uh, in, in this list. Uh, due to fact that this is a new um, and emergent disease, so it, can, it even cannot be uh, in, in this list. Um, that's why now um, Armenian society, uh, during one month, a recent month, they are trying to give the message for social responsibility of the society. So if you want to uh, give or raise the social responsibility of the society, so this is a continuous work with the society and the policymakers must take into consideration uh, all the lessons uh, from the situation of COVID. So thanks a lot for your attention. Dr. Pipoyanu, we thank, uh, thanks a lot for sharing uh, your experience uh, from Armenia and the, from Italy uh, also. I would like uh, to ask uh, Christine Voskerchan, uh, you as a leader of NGO in Armenia who is running different projects in the area of uh, combating fake news, uh, tell us please what is Armenian public opinion on fake news and um, are there any official uh, for formation resources of, of, or official sites managed by government in Armenia? Uh, Christina, connect to your microphone please. Connect your microphone, we don't hear you. Uh, it's uh, downstairs yeah. on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? 
Yes, yes, so I hear you very well. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Did you hear uh, about, did you, did you hear our questions? I would like you as a CEO yes, of NGOs yes. in Armenia, you, um, because you are running different projects on combating fake news too. Uh, so yeah. sharing as a, a pu Armenian public opinion on fake news and uh, your situation, government uh, uh, fighting on uh, and official sites uh, uh, managed by government in the area of combating false news. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you, Diana, for organizing such a wonderful event. I'm just, I I'm just, I just moderate uh, the, the event, no. so we have this However, organizer, um, so we, it's our institute and director, Vitaly Sili. I just yes. was asked to, to manage the event today, but that I'm was... so happy to manage this because, uh, you know, um, uh, we connect, we try to connect our Moldovian uh, uh, scientific civil, scientific uh, uh, world, uh, civil society and also government institutions in order to, to do a connection in order to discuss to debate different subjects on security yes. and national interest yes. for us is very important and thank I, you uh, as a foreigner so actually foreigners. actually my yeah. next my next com comment was i was going to thank all the organizers initiators sponsors and founders because this is a very important topic for nowadays it's it's not only important i would say it's critical but uh since we and it's a great idea to have the diversity of people here not only speaking different languages which we greatly enjoy but also coming with different coming from different backgrounds from university backgrounds professors civil society representatives but um, uh, just people who know Dr. David Pipoyan um, would understand how difficult and how risky it is to speak after him <laughs> because he's the, the most <laughs> reliable scientific and one of the most favorite figures in Armenian public. Um, I would suggest that we have a very, very um, active and very bright member of civil society representative here. I would suggest that um, we listen to the opinion, we listen to the comments made by presentation of Alexandra Siege, and afterwards, as a civil society representative, the head of NGO, I would love to make some comments and additions if you don't mind. Yes, so, uh, so I would I will I would like to uh, to to present to introduce us, uh, uh, Dr. Alexandra Sitch, uh, who is uh, joining us, and uh, thank you for accepting. Um, uh, we would like to find out uh, the experience of your country, Alexandra, uh, around the COVID-19. Uh, is it uh, a made-up story or a re reality, indeed? And uh, Alexandra, how does your country deal with Corona info and the communication? Yes, well, thanks a lot again, Diana, for organizing everything. Sorry, I barged in this morning. I didn't realize I shouldn't be there yet. But so, you know, uh, thanks so much for organizing it. I'm really interested to, to share a bit our opinions, our different views from the different countries. And also, Christina, thank you so much for introducing me to Diana, to all the others. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Um, yeah, it's great to have an international community like this and to really uh, well, share really maybe even completely different opinions and, and uh, ideas. I think it is important to have this diversity. It is more important than ever, as you told us also, Christina. Uh, we're all in this COVID-19 together, we all know that. It's really a problem which is, uh, which is really there for everybody. Um, I myself, I work for Civitas and Publica, it's a civil society NGO, uh, really empowering the capacity of civil society, which means critical thinking, uh, also development of uh, um, empathy, in society, which is really important, I think, in these uh, in these days. And um, well, I, I did a PhD in uh, international relations, and I'm an international mediator. So, just uh, resolving conflicts uh, on an international level, where I also work with different cultural and different personal opinions, which really makes sometimes conflicts very interesting. But it also goes back to every person itself, and there you have really a universal level 
also in conflicts and in different opinions, every person likes to be heard. Every person likes to have his feelings uh, be respected. I think that's already the basis of civil society. So uh, that's where I'm starting. And what I find very interesting, I'm, I'm working from the Netherlands and from France, uh, also a lot in Germany. So I see more of this European view. I've got a bit of a helicopter European view. And uh, I like to give a bit my part of this, uh, which is so including these, uh, mainly these three countries, also Italy, I'm working a lot with. So I was following the developments quite closely the past uh, months. Um, what we did see is uh, very, very interesting that most of the governments reacted to the, the same moment, around the same moment. We all saw some of the very dramatic scenes in Italy. Uh, really elderly people uh, being on their beds, uh, not being able to go in the uh, intensive care. Really very frightening images. So everybody was already influenced by this. Uh, then we had so many governments uh, talking about this. We had an announcement in the Netherlands and also in France that there were really worrying uh, figures in the IC, people coming to IC and uh, worrying figures with tested people. Some of them had tests. So this was suddenly really a reason for most of the countries to go into uh, confinement. So it really meant in uh, Netherlands, in France, even France even more, to be locked up at home, only get out for shopping or for a uh, small exercise of 500 meters from your house. In, Netherlands, in the Netherlands, there was a bit more uh, freedom in Germany also, but in principle, there was no uh, there was no going to, uh, uh, to jobs anymore, no going out in principle. Everybody was at home. So it was really mm -hmm. the slogan, stay at home. And this was in every country the same. Um, uh, everybody was following this news, we also with my colleagues. And at a certain moment, we saw, of course, there were tests, but not enough tests. People could not be tested enough. Uh, there were people in the IC, but we heard more and more worrying uh, reports from doctors. Yeah, but we are very often even forced to put, put COVID-19 on the certificate, but th th this was not really the, the, the cause of death. So these things were already worrying. Uh, at a certain moment, uh, there was also, uh, of course, in YouTube uh, videos which were circulating about questioning where did this COVID-19 come from? From China, from the wet market? Uh, uh, did it come from, uh, maybe, was it maybe in Wuhan, developed in the, in the laboratory? There was no real transparency. It started with this. And in fact, there was less and less transparency. So. Uh, at a certain moment, a doctor started in the Netherlands, in France, to come up with medication, grow green. Uh, you can discuss if it's right or not, but it's part of science. Doctors came up with ideas how to uh, make your immune system stronger. They made whole videos about it, uh, good health, uh, good uh, vitamin C, D, and so on. These were already starts. How to get out of that visual circle of being in this COVID-19. But at a certain point we saw, we followed it, we saw both in Germany, England, uh, in, um, in the Netherlands and in France that certain videos were just censored, they were taken down from doctors who were really reasonable in their ideas. Or Is this really uh, the right? Is this really this flu? Is it really COVID-19? Is every death casualty COVID-19? So there was already a question. People started to ask, but during um, open, it was done a sort, a sort of small open debate in the Netherlands and in France during the uh, measurements, the, 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 the discussion of the measurements. Uh, but the, these questions were not really answered. So we saw less and less transparency. People need to know in civil society what is happening. Then suddenly uh, people came up with ideas, yeah, where, uh, where does suddenly all that money come from? For all this propaganda of one and a half meters mm -hmm. uh, society, the new normal in every country, they all have the same slogans, the new normal. Uh, we have also this slogan of, uh, you, you, while you stay at home, uh, we, we need to accept this. Of course, we need to be very critical also of the vulnerable groups, but 
what is disconcerting, and I think this could really be our main uh, thought at the moment, is um, who has the monopoly of the truth? Um, it is uh, quite important to know where does, how is the truth being uh, shaped? I think with open debate, open dialogue, transparency, of course, of where money comes from. And we saw in several uh, figures that national health organizations were sponsored. And I was really sorry for Mr. Pipoyan, but they were sponsored uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. Uh, pharma industry, there's, for example, a vaccine, a big vaccine a company here who's, uh, who's uh, developing vaccines. They're all, they're 100% funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we do see, if you're really just doing some research, and especially independent journalists I'm talking about, uh, we do see there's something to be discussed. I'm just asking questions, you know, I'm not immediately saying that's the case. Um, in the Euro in European Union, we've had for years a very neoliberal politics where money was merely a sort of religion. So big money was, in a way, determining what was happening. Lots of multinationals not paying their taxes, are still not paying. They are not still being helped by the government. But the smaller companies were really suffering now from this, this uh, pand thank pandemic. Thank you, Alexandra. So very you. little. It yes. is very little. So that is a bit of a problem. And I think we should really discuss what is, what is real science. Is science, uh, should it be funded by individual money or just public money to get really the best science we can have uh, and also uh, public debate is important. We need different opinions. We need doctors and scientists to come into the discussion and open debate before you can really trust measures and you can really trust the, the news. Because if there's censorship, it means there's something has to be hidden usually. That is something Did, we should see. This We have seen in the past in history. So. I think this yeah, Alexandra, uh, thank you uh, very much for your valuable, uh, valuable uh, report. You know, um, Armenia, Moldova, and Georgia, we are small countries, and uh, European Union uh, members' countries' uh, experience in uh, combating COVID-19, in uh, combating uh, false news is very important for us. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will go back to Christina, please. Yes. Uh, what are Armenians' uh, experience and uh, okay. how, uh, uh, what, how we discussed about uh, Armenians' public opinion on combating pain? pain this, is, this is very touchy and at the same time very dangerous topic because to tell the truth, my personal assumption and my personal feelings are that there is too much confusing information coming from different sources. And I do believe that the truth is something between, in the middle. Because um, I personally, my heart says that there is too much exag exaggeration, like too much uh, panic. But from other side, when I start thinking just trying to analyze the situation by facts and trying to be kind of pragmatic and trusting the figures, I start thinking, what if this information, if not all, but at least part of it is true? And that's why I was trying to, to be more responsible. I haven't been visiting my parents for two and a half months because I know that my mother has diabetes and she's in a very, very strong risk zone. And what if, unfortunately, touch to wood, God forbid, if, if I just infect her, even if I don't have any symptoms and then she get infected, would I ever forgive myself for this mistake? Never. From other side, I'm starting thinking, okay, two months, three months, how long? Can I wait in my house and not visit my mother? So the solution I found for myself, and I think many Armenians share my uh, opinion, is that every person should keep the, the regulation, the laws by himself. Very simple, washing your hands, wearing gloves, wearing masks, and don't listen to this garbage because uh, this fake news 
I've been hearing the most disgusting news on this COVID-19 since it has been spreading, since January, since February, uh, starting with uh, spreading it with bananas, ending with a disgusting story with a Chinese guy having sex with bats, which was un incredible. So we just, I think we should just stop listening to this garbage. We should uh, follow the very basic r rules. And my situation is very interesting. I work for the government organization. My permanent job is food safety inspection body. So you can imagine how much responsibility is on our inspection body. But yeah. um, I want to have my presentation as a member of NGO, the representative of civil society, because I don't have that authority to speak on behalf of the government now. However, I was the person who has translated officially the first information from the World Health Organization when we first received that and gave it to the government. And um, even then, nobody in Armenia was 100% sure whether this information is true, 100% real or not. So later, what happened is like on the 23rd of March, there was too much scrap and garbage in pandemic field. We call it infodemic sometimes. Uh, that the Armenian government was to declare a special package of amendments uh, restricting dissemination of fake news, which was, uh, to me, absolutely violation of human rights. I mean, if I say something, what I think about it, then I'm getting maybe fined or restricted. Uh, fortunately, two weeks later, um, even the European Union and the representative of OSC, I think it was Mr. Dezer, who um, expressed his opinion that this package is really, really against human rights. It's a violation of human rights. And they, they canceled this package, which was very good because mass media, now they have different figures uh, telling different stories, but at least we are open to hear, to listen, and to select our own, to filter. This is very important, to filter the information. So now Armenian public, they don't want to panic anymore. They just try to keep very simple regulations, very simple rules. Uh, stores will not allow anybody without mask or gloves. Uh, people walking on the street without masks, but not with many people, just one, two, in a, in a one, meter, one and a half meter distance. What else? Um, that's it. That's what we can do. I mean, we should live with this. And I think time, time will show. <laughs> you are right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because uh, we're speaking about Armenia and Georgia. So as I will go back to Professor Maisai. Yeah. Uh, before uh, speaking with Darius about Poland experience in combating false news and pandemia. Uh, Professor, uh, the same question, please. Uh, if you can share us the uh, uh, experience of Georgian, Georgian legislation in combating, uh, combating false news, because it's very important. How can we input, for example, some legislation in the Republic of Moldova, if you can share us, uh, what experience do you have in Georgia? Okay, thank you very much uh, for these questions. Unfortunately, the Georgian legislation is very scarce in that kind of just about basics, because in Georgia, we don't have just a concrete uh, laws just about to make impossible to share the fake uh, news but we have a special strategic communication strategy which was elaborated with help of the nato the proper agencies and uh, nato is, is um, uh, structures international um, uh, well, international uh, uh, community structures and uh, even uh, in georgians in nation security strategy and uh, national military strategy, it's uh, also indicated how Georgia should combat with uh, the informational warfare, mainly stated from the Kremlin, just about the case, because you know, as you know, just Georgia and Russia still in the war game uh, engagement at the Pacto and the Euro, because this has actually. Uh, Medvedev and Sarkozy's agreement was only just a ceasefire agreement and not a complete peace uh, 
agreement and we are still in war game with Russia Federation and this uh, creeping occupation is a real uh, case and how Georgia is engaged with war with Russia it's one point uh, and even I would like to mention just uh, with NATO's um, uh, PFP consortium uh, uh, consortium with engaged on the NATO uh, public relations uh, department and uh, even with engagement of the Austria's Ministry of Defense, it was created a special, just about ad hoc uh, working group where Georgian two representatives, me and uh, Mrs. Teona Kubadia, uh, just been in, get involved. And our group mission is to create a special manual and to, to set up a special, just about policy recommendations in order that how just we just counterweight and uh, counterfight against. Uh, fake news and against about information war stemming from the just uh, uh, those uh, countries who are uh, declared as a well competitors or i'd say enemies to euro euro atlantic community so this is like Thank a you. main implications from georgian experience that's where we are Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's very important uh, to, for our countries, I think, uh, to input, uh, input some uh, um, uh, good legislation uh, from European Union and uh, other countries uh, in the area of uh, combating false news to have uh, some approaches, uh, experience of our countries too. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. And here we have um, uh, in our English speaking panel, we have our last participant from Poland. Uh, please, uh, Darius, uh, Darius Jacek, uh, he's as the uh, representatives of NGOs in Poland, of civil society. Uh, I would ask you, uh, David, are, are, we, are you with us here now? Because I don't see you. David, can you, can you, can you give yes, us a sign? Darius is with us, I see him. Uh, okay, uh, Darius, uh, uh, we uh, would like to ask you uh, what steps and measures uh, does Polish government take uh, to fight against fake, fake news on COVID-19. And uh, if uh, is there a cooperation between uh, government and the mass media against dissemination of uh, fake news on COVID-19 in Poland? Yes, uh, PAP, Polish Press Agents, has loud the fake... Uh, Darius, counter just a sec. Yes, 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 please. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no problem. Uh, come back to uh, my uh, answer. Um, from a flash fake hunter system to fight less about pandemics. The Polish government, GovTech Polska, has developed the change and will sell it to a news agency. The website operates in Polish and English using it plug in for Firefox and Chrome. According to PAP, the a flash fake hunter program works to very content published on the internet and revel on through news items related in the coronavirus. All verified reports are the included in a special news service linked with the flash fake hunter website and social media profiles. More than 500 volunteers from Poland stepped up for the program following PAP special recruiting process. The flash uh, fake counter service is free for any concurrent reader on media outlets. I, I just I just want to add one thing, uh, Darius, to mention about the um, fake finder apps application for uh, telephones, which was created in Poland. I think that was a very good idea. In Armenia, for example, the government also wanted to do something identical, but it was the worst kind of it. They started tracking the mobile phones just to make sure that people who have been in contact with infected patients, just to track their mobility. And public was not happy with this at all because they were thinking that this is violation of your you know, personal data. But however, they did it. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Darius, do you have to, to add something? Darius, are you here? Mm -hmm. The next question, I mean. 
The next, next, next question, question was, when we discussed about if you can uh, share with us uh, uh, something about um, uh, cooperation between government and mass media and in Poland against dissemination of fake news on COVID-19. Uh, okay, uh, Mateusz Morawiecki met with the representative of Poland leading media. The Prime Minister stressed the importance of correct information police uh, in fighting coronavirus. The Prime Minister said that only official sources of government decision or daily community and press conference, as well as government website, they use the gov.pl domain. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, that is, uh, do you know, uh, is, is very important. Poland, considering that one of the, the democratic uh, and uh, success, successful uh, country uh, in European Union on fighting uh, uh, fake news, and uh, uh, I know, uh, because I have participated in different uh, projects in Poland, uh, uh, and I know that cooperation between uh, uh, civil society and mass media on dissemination of uh, disinformation and uh, fighting against propaganda and fake news is very successful in Poland, too. Diana, and thank I'm you sorry, so I'm... much. Yes, yeah, Christina. I have one question to all the participants. I wonder if in your countries, you have any uh, official information sources indicated by your government where you can get in on that sites and get the official data or statistics on COVID? Yes, yes. From, from, from Moldova, from Moldova, Spat, I will uh, uh, tell you because we'll discuss uh, uh, later about this. Unfortunately, it will be in Romanian uh, because here we have uh, a very good and successful uh, uh, NGOs so we greatly, the, we greatly enjoy the Romanian, no. by the way. I, I yes. enjoy the Romanian. I yes, enjoy I promise Romanian. you, dear, dear foreign participants, I promise you that all yeah. conclusions yeah. and recommendations yeah. from... In uh, Georgian, our, we have the concrete direct access to the Georgian government. Yeah, has I a special site. You, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, yes, I promise you that after our, our event, I will send you all conclusions and recommendations uh, from uh, today's event, and translated in English for sure. Yes, but uh, so my, my, suggestion was, my suggestion was I would like to respond to Christina that, if it is possible. I would like to respond to Christina. Thank yes. you, Nicoleta so Montiano. I will introduce uh, uh, Nicoleta Montiano, professor, Romanian professor from University of CBU. Uh, oh, yes, yes, professor. Okay. Um, thank you, Christina, for your answer. Actually, in Romania, we do have an official site and uh, it is very uh, good because there is a collaboration between uh, the, yeah, the or non-organizational uh, institutions and the government. And the name of the site is officialsources.ro. Uh, uh, if you will have the patience to remain for our, my presentation uh, uh, and my colleague presentation, uh, sure. for Jensen, with you, we will be able to present in Romanian, but the main information to try to translate in English if you are interested. Yes, so uh, definitely. Uh, I think, I think yeah, that but I would like because we are out of schedule very much. We are yeah. half of hour uh, later. Diana, but uh, one, one thing, I'm sorry, I'm speaking too much, but that's how I am always. Sorry. No, no. Yes, <laughs> yes, no, we're um, I want, I would just suggest that all of us just provide the links for the official information and then we can get into it to this christina sorry sorry i didn't get it i i do know uh, official information should be right but i would still want you all really to wonder has your government deserved their trust that is a big question that, that's also a good question that's a good question because these governments very often yeah. don't work with psychologists philosophers or sociologists that's the problem. And we must also say, have they deserve this trust with their ethics for healthcare in the past years? Just, uh, these are just questions. I'm not making any yeah. conclusions. You're right, you're right, Alexandra. Uh, so the same, the same as uh, Nicoleta told, in Moldova we also have an yeah. official site where is input all uh, uh, fake news uh, sites. Yeah. Uh, and as I told you, but I will, I will translate it in English, we will send you. Uh, with this one, uh, dear guest speakers, uh, thank you for sharing your country's experience in fighting the pandemic.
and uh, fake news on COVID-19. Um, we hope that uh, to have uh, you along us uh, during uh, other scientifical and practical uh, activities too. Um, and now we'll uh, finish our English speaking session and we'll uh, speak in Romania with our colleagues from Romania because the most participants are Romanian speakers and we uh, plan to do only to organize only one panel in English and others in Romanian uh, because uh, uh, the goal was uh, to uh, approach uh, uh, this connection between Moldavian national uh, platform of communication between uh, civil society, uh, state institutions, and the uh, scientific uh, area. Uh, Sorry, so Diana, much. I have a question for uh, participants. For our I put participants, because you, you yeah. think we need more time, we need a follow up. That's for sure. Only one question, it is an institutional yes. question. First of all, I would like to say thank you for your presentation, for your experiences. Uh, my question is about the collaboration between uh, state institutions from the security sector with uh, civil societies or uh, private sector or uh, other actors regarding to fighting uh, uh, fake news on COVID or in the context of hybrid war, because uh, you emphasized the situation when we speak about what human rights, uh, but how to fight uh, this fake news without collaboration between state institutions, academia, civil societies, maybe we have a good practices in these uh, issues. Um. So, uh, probably Professor, Professor Maisai, uh, if you can uh, tell us uh, the question is uh, uh, for you. Uh, can you share uh, your uh, uh, Jordan experience? Okay, okay. Experience? Thank you very much for this very interesting questions and most uh, uh, also trouble uh, sourcing question because uh, unfortunately, it's my personal assumption, so there's a special just about coordination uh, maybe structures about to coordinate effort to business uh, NGO and media and governmental just these uh, structures is not just about um, available at time of being I also propose to the Georgian government to create a special consul consultative about the special council mm -hmm. of from expert community in order just to make uh, good forecasts and analytical just approaches and to make uh, just about some consensus on some cases but Georgian government I don't know they just ignore this is my proposal as always so in that regards uh, I am just not uh, keen on that uh, issue so uh, all all each of this uh, sector about NGO media business they are just to follow up their own just about uh, mission and prescriptions and government also just you know how to say flying on its own way unfortunately it's a uh, one of the main problem in Georgia what we have faced at time of being of course Georgian government communicate with media they have more information briefings and they have even just special site where you can just jo join the site, you can just see all these uh, processes, how Georgian government is tackled with these issues. But unfortunately, such kind of this about a uh, joint consultative agency or structures, unfortunately, is still pending problem. This is a reality Thank on you. Georgian case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. So uh, with uh, this one, uh, let me to, to finish English speaking panel and uh, I will uh, thank uh, again, thank again uh, the, the, our guest speakers uh, from Georgia, much. Armenia, Netherlands, Poland um, uh, and uh, with about, what about Romania we'll uh, speak later. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, valuable uh, com comments and uh, for sure we'll uh, cooperate, cooperate uh, during a, of our our's project too. Thank you so much. Și cu această ocazie, haide, permiteți-mi să trecem la acel panel de discuție pentru că au fost câteva schimbări, modificări în agenda noastră pe motiv al motivul vorbit, traducerii în engleză pentru vorbitorii participanții noștri de peste hotare. Aș vrea, pentru că suntem la segmentul discuției, experienței, combaterii știrilor false, în alte state, în afara Republicii Moldova, aș vrea să întreb profesorul uh, 
Eugen Străuțiu, profesor în cadrul Universității Lucian Blaga din Sibiu. Domnule profesor, ați vrea să ne spuneți care sunt platformele de colaborare între societatea civilă, mediul academic și instituțiile guvernamentale din România? De altfel, este aceeași întrebare pe care doamna Albu, doamna doctor Albu a acordat-o colegilor noștri de peste hotare. Dacă ați vrea să vă exprimați, vă mulțumim. I absolutely agree with you, Diana. Domnule Strauțiu? Okay. Just before we say goodbye, because I feel that we don't have, there's a language barrier, I think we should, it would be great to have another meeting just specifically presenting the most tangible results on cooperation uh, as our dear professor mentioned, cooperation between uh, government, mass media, and NGO. That is a very important issue we should be touched separately, and we should go in more details and present the experiences of each country. And for language barrier, I personally would be more than happy to provide online translation in from Russian to English and English to Russian, yes. if you need. Yes. Uh, dear Christina, this is uh, today we just launched a platform of communication yes. be, be between these societies and uh, state institutions. And it was a great and for start. Sure, uh, this is just the first event uh, during of our platform of communication. For sure, we'll meet each other uh, during of other discussions and sure. uh, with other topics of uh, national interest and security one. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank so you. now, if you if you'd like uh, to to still to still to be connected with us, but it will be a Romanian uh, Romanian speaking panel. Thank you so much. So I will share you uh, all conclusions and uh, and um, uh, recommendations from our today's event. Alexandra, thank you so much. Christina, uh, Darius, David, uh, and the professor my side. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Hope to meet again. Bye. Yeah. Bye.